What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast, Mass Media Hysteria. My name is Court. I will be your host for the duration. With me, as always, is Chris. How's it going, everybody? And down below, making his once again triumphant return, we have Andres. Howdy. And today we have uh, a few quick topics that we're going to talk about uh, right at the beginning. We're going to talk about the latest development in the IATSE strike. We'll get to that very shortly. We are going to talk about Agatha Harkness uh, out of, uh, of course, WandaVision is getting her own spinoff series on Disney+. Plus. We are going to talk a little bit about Ghostbusters Afterlife. They've done a couple more screenings. We have uh, some, we might go through a couple of quick reviews, um, but apparently the uh, it, it's pretty positive. Then uh, we, Chris and I are going to talk a little bit about Midnight Mass, the latest uh, series from Mike Flanagan on Netflix. It's not going to be a full spoilers review, um, but we are potentially going to talk some spoilers. So just know that I'll warn you guys ahead, uh, ahead of time again when we get there. Then Andres and I are going to talk uh, spoilers review of James Bond, No Time to Die. And then finally, we have, uh, and, and Chris is going to dip out for a bit of that because he hasn't seen it yet. We don't want to ruin it for him. Yet. Seen it today. I'm <clears throat> oh, there you go. Um, and then uh, uh, bring, bring pajamas, by the way. It's really long. <laughs> um, and then finally, uh, we have a little discussion question. Andres, do you want to give us a little tease of what that's going to be? Why, yes, it is October and it's spooky time. So we're going to be talking about our favorite Halloween franchise. Well, not Halloween, but horror franchises. Mm-hmm. That's what it's going to be. Not hey. Halloween, just in general, of mm-hmm. all of the... Of all of them. I hope you didn't pick Halloween as your answer because you just gave it away. <laughs> no, I did not. Okay. All right, so first off, just, just very quickly, um, last time we did the show... Uh, we talked about the IATSE strike. The IATSE is uh, a union. Um, I'm trying to remember uh, what it stands for. International House of Pancakes. Um, that's it. That's it. Let me say so, <laughs> IATSE. A very I, delicious cause. I think it's the International Association I got of it. Theater and Stage. You're close. Yeah. International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Okay. Um, yeah. So which pretty much covers a, a vast, like, so many different areas of, of, of film production from um, <laughs> from production assistants to grips to camera assistants all the way to catering and makeup hairstylist to editing so you, you know you just throw throw a dart on a, on the board of filmmaking uh, you know professions this pretty much covers it it's basically pretty much everybody but producers directors and actors and, and writers writers so and writers, like yeah. writers have separate but so pretty much everybody else that makes a movie is is covered by here so the fact that as we mentioned a couple weeks ago they they're potentially going on strike is huge it's yeah. it's huge because it would absolutely stop all production not just some all production no, and um, not not even things currently in production, but stuff in post production too, right? Because exactly. editing, visual effects, mm-hmm. all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, this this really could grind Hollywood to a halt. So, yeah. and again, just for just quickly, basically the main thing they're striking, or they they potentially may strike for, is more equitable treatment, particularly when it comes to time off, because mm-hmm. a lot of these people work stupid like 16, 18 hour days. Um, and then they get in car crashes on their way home because they're yeah. exhausted or it destroys their family lives. Or mm-hmm. um, They're not even really asking, I don't think really for a whole lot more money. Uh, it's mostly about time. Yeah. So uh, basically the, the, the update here is that they were talking about potentially going on strike. They had a vote and it was something, it was big. It was something like 98% pro not to strike. The vote wasn't to strike. It was to approve the ability to strike. So basically mm-hmm. now the president or the, the head of IATSE can call a strike at any point now that it's been approved by the union itself. Mm-hmm. So I think that was probably a bit of a sort of a bargaining chip when going to the uh, the producers mm-hmm. union. Uh, hopefully that will get talks happening again um, because, you know, we want, we, we want our movies, but we want, you know, equitable treatment for all these people who work really really long hours yeah absolutely that's Um, that's what what's most important even the even the best film ever made wouldn't be worth it if if it was you know at the expense of people hurting themselves losing you know their lives their time it it's 
treating the filmmakers, all of them, doesn't matter like a what kind of end of the of the hierarchy that they are, from producers all the way to production assistants grabbing coffee. They des they deserve respect and they deserve to be treated equally. Um, so yeah, and and here's again as we were talking about with when it came to just this strike bringing Hollywood to its knees and just putting a halt on everything. That's something that I'm really hoping is just kind of makes whoever whoever the this this union is trying to make a deal with. I'm not sure like who they're speaking with, but I'm hoping that essentially Hollywood and the big studio wigs or whatever they they pony up because I I think that they it's just a game of chicken at this point, point. Um, and the the IATSE union is not gonna they're not gonna back down from it. And Hollywood I think just kind of needs to get over their greed and just be like, all right, well, I mean we literally cannot function without any of you. So let's not go down that path. That's what I'm hoping right. for, but you never know. Yeah, I mean, hopefully it'll it'll um, it'll it'll change Hollywood for the better. Yeah. Um, going forward, I'm just trying to find the name. Uh, yeah. So the the producers union that they're sort of going up against is the AMPTP, which is the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. Mm -hmm. So, there I'm just the. Uh... I'm picturing that like the two percent that voted no. It's like Mr. Burns with a mustache. <laughs> no, I don't want to go and strike. No. I love our wages. Yeah. Um, no, but yeah. So I, I can imagine it's it's just to some people who they, I mean, understandably, when you go on strike, you're not getting paid. So well, yeah, the, I, the idea of like I think that the that's 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 the the shitty part of it and i can understand why there's even a small percent that don't want to because they're like hey this is my job and i know that we're trying to strike for something better but i literally can't go several weeks without pay right. um so yeah that's why i'm like just don't don't let it get to that point let's yeah. resolve yeah. it beforehand absolutely. absolutely all right shall we move on then gentlemen let's sure. do it Okay, so uh, again, a very sort of brief uh, news story here, but of course, Agatha Harkness, who was the main villain, uh, it was not Mephisto. Uh, that joke's never going to get old. Um, <laughs> Agatha Harkness was the main villain, of course, on the Marvel Disney Plus series WandaVision, which uh, I believe, Chris, you and I decided that was our favorite of the three. I yeah, um, uh, even despite it, it kind of having a disappointing ending for me. Yeah. I think that overall I've enjoyed that one the most. Right. And Andres, you didn't watch that one, right? No, I did not. Okay. Um, so Agatha Harkness as played by Catherine Hahn, played wonderfully by the great Catherine Hahn is getting a spinoff series at Disney plus. It will be uh, written. And I believe show run by Jack Schaefer, who is the head writer on WandaVision. So that's cool. Um, not, not really much to talk about here. Um, but you know, I, for one, I, I'm into it. I really, really liked Catherine Hahn on that show. I thought she was great. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess Andres, you didn't watch it. So, uh, I don't know if you have any opinions about this, uh, but nope. Chris, what do you think? Um, it's, I'm kind of mixed. Uh, I mean, obviously it's, it's so early in development. I mean, it's probably not even technically in development at the moment that it's hard to say. You know, maybe in a year or two from now, if we start seeing some trailers for it, that could kind of pique my interest. At the moment, not really. I I love Catherine. I love Catherine Hahn, and I loved her in the role. It was such a fun character. But I'm not at the moment. I'm not sure that character is strong enough to kind of hold their own show. Right. Uh, I mean, so far Loki is the only villain. That that you know, or only character that started out as a villain that kind of got their own property, and that was after Tom Hiddleston was in several movies. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he he had been a part of the MCU for so long, and he was he was a beloved character, so it made sense to kind of have a show about him. But Agatha Harkness, she was just in in one show, and she really didn't even reveal herself as a villain until towards the end of the show. So I'm gonna kind of sound like Andres here, who oh no, who. Uh, who kind of goes on, you've talked before about like, they're just kind of being too much, like an oversaturation of the Marvel properties. Eventually that's going to happen. To me, it, ha I, it doesn't reach that point for me yet. For a lot of people it has. But if they start doing like a, here's a show for every minor character right. in the MCU, it's like, I that it will reach kind of oversaturation for me. So I'm not writing it off entirely yet. Again, I, I'll wait to see, hear more about it. Um, 
but at the moment if you were just to ask me like are you excited the answer is no okay yeah I, i'm kind of there with you i mean i think <clears throat> i would at least check out the pilot because i love Catherine Hahn so much yeah um but you know i, I don't know that i need it but no whatever i don't know uh did you want to say something Anders? yes okay Ooh. I uh, am just, I'm holding out. I'm waiting for them to do the spin off for Guy Who Was Playing Galaga in the Avengers movie. Ah, yes. <laughs> that's, that's the that's, real hero that we that's all gonna be, to follow. Oh, man. Yeah. He's just going to play Galaga on screen. Yeah. But it's going to be, it's going to be a prequel. Yeah. When he, when he first got the game, he's not very good at it at first. Yeah. And only get through the first couple levels. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. going to be good. All right, so uh, Chris, you wanted to talk about Ghostbusters Afterlife, which is, of course, the new Ghostbusters movie uh, coming from uh, writer director. I'm gonna Jason his... Reitman. Jason Reitman, thank you. Mm. Uh, I like Jason Reitman as a filmmaker. Of course, mm. he is the son of Ivan Reitman, who was the director of the first two Ghostbusters mm. movies. This is kind of a sequel. I mean, we know that. Uh, I mean, we hear uh, Ray stands. In the trailer, we hear his voice. Yeah. Uh, we hear people referring to Egon. I think we see, um, what's her name? The secretary. I forgot uh, what her name is. Janine Melnitz. Janine. Yeah, thank Janine. You. Thank you. Uh, I believe we see her in the trailer. Um, I've, been, I've been psyched for this. This is a movie that was supposed to come out quite a ways ago, but mm -hmm. pandemic, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it has had a couple of screenings. We did talk about it a few weeks ago after the first screening. And there were a lot of positive thoughts coming out of it. Now they've done one or two more. Uh, Chris, and, you, you kind of brought this up. What did you want to talk about? Yeah, the reason why I wanted to bring it up is because although they screened it before, uh, it was at CinemaCon about a month ago, um, we heard some reactions from it. I always took those with a grain of salt because it was a surprise screening right. uh, with a lot of like news press people. Anyway, uh, but now they've had some other screenings and the review embargo is already lifted. And this movie's not even coming out for, for about another month which is always a good sign because it shows that the studio is uh, very uh, very confident in the yeah. product. Yeah. And so, yeah, no, not, nothing to say too much because neither of us have seen it yet. Again, again, it's not out. But I wanted to bring it up because so far, the reviews and the, and the general opinion is, is very popular um, or very positive, I should say. So I, I got like a bit of a review roundup. I'm just going to read a couple blurbs and then throw it to you guys to see where, if this does anything for your excitement. So right off the bat from IGN, they gave it a very, very solid review uh, stating a delightfully lovely movie that will satisfy those who grew up with Ramus, Hudson, Murray, and Aykroyd. Ghostbusters Afterlife will make youngsters fall just as in love with the new generation. Uh, some other ones saying, well, it's taken 36 years. Uh, this is from the New York Post. Well, it's taken 36 years in six uh, presidencies, but with Ghostbusters Afterlife, fans finally have an unembarrassing sequel to love. Um, uh, this is from The Hollywood Reporter. Afterlife's, in, Afterlife's engaging cast has the comic beats down and they also pay uh, more fully fleshed people, uh, sorry, and they also play more fully fleshed people than the first film offered, reflecting the director's interest in character-driven stories. So uh, there's stuff like that. Um, and I, after doing a, book, a few read, like, read-throughs of it, the general impression that I got is this will simultaneously satisfy fans of the original two that that wanted that have wanted to see a, a proper sequel uh, with these characters. And although they haven't shown it in the trailers, it's it's already been kind of announced that yes, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, uh, Ernie Hudson, uh, Sigourney Weaver, and Janine, the actress that plays Janine, they're returning. Annie Potts. Annie, Annie Potts. Potts. Thank you. Thank you. How could I forget? This guy coming in clutch today. Yeah, he knows his Ghostbuster stuff. But what's interesting as well is that they say it's going to satisfy the, the fans of that, but it's also not just their show. It, it They say that it's really much like very much about uh, kind of the, the newer cast, uh, the kind of like this younger, um, this, this younger team played by McKenna Grace, Finn Wolfhard, um, Paul Rudd's in it, obviously. And that's what gets me excited that, it's not just kind of seemingly, seemingly, it's not just like this nostalgic, uh, hued kind of, you know, just nostalgia fest where it's not yeah. just like, all right, here you go. You remember the first one? It sounds like it's, it's kind of striking that good balance of being its own thing, being something new, but also, you know, being respectful and, and, and giving fans what they wanted to see since 19, what, 1989 was when Ghostbusters 2 something came out. Like that, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited. 
a lot of the last thing I'll say as well before throwing it throwing it to you guys is that something that also gets me excited is that a lot of reviewers are stating that the trailers do not give away a lot of it. Like there's there's some there's a lot of surprises left story wise, uh, cameos or or characters or actors that that are big name that they haven't even released yet. Um, so that gets me excited too that the trailers really don't show much of what this movie has to offer. So I'm stoked. And uh, just just quick, you brought up Ghostbusters 2, which, you know, not not a great sequel. There, there are things about it I love, mm. particularly including the uh, inclusion of Jackie Wilson's Lifting Me Higher. Great song, <laughs> big fan. Mm. Yeah. Um, but mm. one thing that I only found out, I don't know, three or four years ago, and it blew my mind. I may have shared this with you guys before, or maybe you guys already knew. But, you know, the villain was Vigo the Carpathian. Yes. Was the guy in the painting. Um, but... I found out that the guy playing him and the guy doing the voice separate guys. Yes. Uh, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if the guy playing him didn't speak English or if he just didn't have the right kind of voice or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, Andres, it seems like, you know, where I'm going with this. Oh, maybe, maybe, not. Okay. maybe. I, I know who the voice was, but okay. I want to see where you're going with this. No, that that's where I'm going. Chris, do you know who it was? Mm -mm. No. Max von Sydow. I was really right and on it's, Emperor Ming himself. And it's it's one of those things where I was like, no way. And then I would go on YouTube and I pull it up. I'm like, yep, mm -hmm. very clearly that's Max von Sydow. Nice. Now, I may not have really known him too terribly well by the time. No, I would have because I'd seen The Exorcist. So, yeah. Yeah. So know. for uh, Max von Sydow is, is was a legendary actor, got his, got his kind of international fame by starring in a lot of Ingmar Bergman films, but then really kind of cemented himself in, in films like The Exorcist, where he played the, the elder priest, Father Marin. Father Marin, yes. Which, what, speaking of which, simultaneously, this, I learned this maybe when I was like early 20, no, late, late teens, early 20s, because I'd seen The Exorcist a bunch of times, hadn't really seen much of Max von Sydow's earlier works, but it took me until literally my late teens to realize that he was wearing old man makeup in The yeah. Exorcist, where I was like, you know, I was just like, oh yeah, it's an old man. Uh, and usually when you see movies from, let's say the 60s or 70s, they don't have the best old age makeup because right. makeup technology has gotten better. But holy shit, did I buy it? The dude was oh, yeah. like 40 at the time and he plays like 70. So yeah. just a little, yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so to actually talk about Ghostbusters Afterlife. Sorry for that little tangent, but okay. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I mean, I've seen a couple of Jason Reitman movies. Up in the Air was really good. Uh, Thank You for Smoking was fantastic. I love that movie. Um, there is something uh, kind of lovely about I, being Ivan Reitman's son and making this film. Yeah. I like what... Poetic. what yeah, that's the word yeah. I was looking for. Um, I like what you were saying or what some of the reviews were saying that it sounds like they're not getting really sort of precious about it and mm -hmm. that they're not going to be just hearkening back, at least from what it sounds like to the old movies. Like they have this new cast mm -hmm. and it sounds like it's going to focus on this new cast mm -hmm. um, while still having um, elements of the original movies. Yeah. And I mean, again, that, 2016 reboot i mean was not loved by a lot of people i didn't love it myself um i'm yeah. i'm psyched for this i'm really looking forward to it i like uh, you know i love paul rudd mm -hmm. um uh, fan of finn wolfhard mckenna grace is i haven't seen her in too much but of course she was in haunting of hill house speaking of mike flanagan she was really good in that yeah um so i'm i'm looking forward to this uh yeah, carrie Carrie Coon, sorry, I just want to say she's terrific. Oh, okay. She was in yep. uh, the second season of Fargo. Um, yep. Absolutely terrific actress. Uh, so yeah, I'm very excited. Andres, tell us your thoughts. It is fascinating watching all the reactions coming in because yeah. nobody's talking about Ghostbusters 2016 anymore. Right, it's man. totally it been erased from existence. Mm -hmm. All the comments like, oh, it's, it's going to be better than Ghostbusters 2. You're like, Bar is pretty, I mean, the bar goes lower, guys. It, mm -hmm. Nobody's talking about it. Uh, it's fascinating. What's interesting to me, though, is uh, this is a Sony property, but it sounds mm -hmm. like they've finally gotten it right mm -hmm. because lifting the review embargo, that's not a Sony thing. They, they <laughs> all they hold off until like a month later. Then they're like, all right, we've conned enough people. Uh, and also yeah. the fact that it's striking this balance between 
nostalgia and like something that's new that's mm. not something sony usually does either so this is like the more i hear about it the more i'm like mm, yeah take, take notes on what you're doing here guys you might make great films mm. yeah, yeah i i'm still expecting a little bit of a, a force awakens effect and oh, by the way yeah. i i love the force awakens again i think we've talked about how we can all agree that it in parts it did follow a new hope too closely yes so I, i'm still expecting that you know i again there's no spoilers out so i'm not I, i've not seen it this is not based on anything but i can imagine that two-thirds of it focuses on the new generation and then the last third probably brings back the original cast and they they bust some ghosts you know what i mean so like yeah. I'm sure by the end of it the the nostalgia is going to kick in it sounds like it doesn't like completely forego it because it is bringing back the entire cast i can imagine there's going to be them suiting up with the with the theme song but that's what you want you know what i mean i think that but will the theme song be uh macy gray and fallout boy again uh, i hope not i hope not if they did oh, then i'd probably if I'd you're probably seeing leave. things run through your head keep oh by the way before uh. before we we move on i do want to say that I think we've mentioned on the show before, but just to not give the wrong impression, we are not, we've talked about it. We are, none of us are in the group of hating Ghostbusters 2016 just because women were in it. That's not why I, it, we I just didn't like the movie. I don't we, think that was an inflation to defend that film. I don't think that many people really were anti-woman. I saw, I saw it. I saw the, I it, mean, obviously it's like, it you know, the there, vocal minority, but-, but well, I mean, that's that's a thing that we we've talked about too. Is when that trailer came out, Sony was deleting because that trailer yeah. did crazy numbers on YouTube. Sony was they got caught like deleting were, comments that were just saying this doesn't look very good. Yeah, but they, they were, were they were they were consciously manufacturing a narrative to defend yeah. the film. Um, they were, yeah. they were they were leaving up comments that were sexist, but just mm -hmm. deleting comments of people saying like, oh, that's not very good. That's yeah right. yeah wanting um, it wanting it to to so although it was there you you're definitely right although it was there the, i think the point that i was trying to make is that we're not a part of that oh and no i think that we're we're like more like most rational people who saw the movie and we're just like it wasn't that funny and yeah. that's it especially when it's a when it's trying to be way more of a broad comedy than the first one ever was mm -hmm. and none of the jokes are landing then it's not it's not entertaining yeah yeah well, I, I, I remember because I was psyched for it. It was like new Ghostbusters movie. I love I love Kate McKinnon. Uh, Leslie Jones, I'm kind of iffy on. Um, Melissa McCarthy, sometimes she's awesome, sometimes not so great. Yeah. Uh, big Kristen Wiig fan. Um, and I remember I remember I was at work and I knew the trailer was coming out at lunchtime. I was like, okay, I'm going to go on my lunch break. I'm going to watch this trailer. I'm psyched. When I watched it, I was just like, oh, that doesn't look very good. Damn. Yeah. And it was just funny too, because in that trailer, it, like the marketing was so confusing because the trailer opens with like 30 years ago, four oh, scientists yeah. save New York. And I was like, two problems with that. One, this movie's a reboot. So 30 years ago, four scientists, no, no, that doesn't make sense. And mm -hmm. two, Winston was not a scientist. There were three scientists and Winston, he was like <laughs> a blue collar guy. Just, ah. As long as there was a paycheck in it, he would say, exactly. Okay. Yeah. What about the Twinkie? Um, so yeah, uh, one another thing I want to point out before we move on. One thing that I like that they're doing with this movie is that just just to change it up a little bit, they're taking it out of New York City. Like it looks like it's taking place yeah. in the country. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. I, I think that'll be something a little bit different. I'm into that. Yeah. I yeah, I, I'm excited for for all the the changes that are being made. And you know, I'm not I as much as I love red letter media. I am not on the level of, of the Red Later Media guys that just hate anything nostalgia. Right. There's some people, and especially I love Red Letter Media, so this is not me trying to say I dislike them, but they, they represent a, a certain group of people, especially that I see on YouTube, that are like anything that's like like trying to, trying to uh, touch you, or not touch you, Jesus, trying to reach you in the nostalgia fields. And they just hate it. Like, oh, it's the right. worst. Nah. But I'm not like that. I'm like, you can you can find a good balance. Do you know? Do some new things. But it's so when the kind of nostalgic moments happen, they kind of hit more. So I'm for it. Yeah, I think I think nostalgia gets it. It's kind of been turned into a dirty word. But like, 
if it's done right, it's great. Yeah. A lot mm-hmm. of times it's just really pandering and then it sucks. Yeah. But you know, if it works, if it's done the right way, you know, like for me, uh, I did not like the film that shall not be named Indiana Jones for uh, most uh. people didn't, but there was that one moment where I think Indy mentions his father and we see like the picture of Sean Connery and like the bust of uh, Dan O'Malley as um, Brody. That was like nostalgia done perfectly. It was just a little nod. It was, mm-hmm. you know, I loved that. So, yeah. so you loved 20 seconds of King yes. of the Crystal Skull. <laughs> Great film for 20 seconds. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm psyched for this. It looks like the movie's coming out on November 11th. Uh, mm. I'm going to go see it and I'm sure we'll talk about it on this here show. Mm. So mm. moving on, uh, Chris and I are going to talk a little bit about Midnight Mass. So Midnight Mass is on Netflix streaming now. I believe it's seven episodes. I think that's right. Yeah, it's seven episodes. They're all about an hour. This is uh, an original story from Mike Flanagan, who Chris, you and I have talked about one of the one of the strongest horror filmmaker storytellers of his generation i mean the guy's mm-hmm. the guy's fairly young uh, yeah. he looks like he's maybe in his 40s tops yeah he's something 40 um but this guy is a guy who's done uh he did uh, a film called hush which i have not seen he did ouija origin of evil i believe which i have not which seen. was it which uh was surprising for two reasons because the original ouija was not a good movie and then this sequel that like, you know, you expect a sequel to a bad horror movie to be even worse. Right. And it was really good. Not not amazing, but it was it was really good. And and he's done that for a lot of stuff. He, like I said, Hush, which is a really solid little movie. I would recommend it. He did Oculus with Karen Gillan. Hmm. Um, and then some more recent things along with Netflix was Gerald's Game. Uh, which was my favorite movie of that year. For a phenomenal one of the one of the on truly better Stephen King adaptations, yeah, and it's it's a great movie. And then I guess him and him and Stephen King are, are buddies because he went on to do Doctor Sleep, which was uh, criminally underrated yeah. box office wise. I thought it was really really good. Um, <coughs> not that many people went to go see it, but he he the yeah. cool thing about what he did with that was he sort of managed to create a sequel to Kubrick's Shining. Mm-hmm but also a sequel to Stephen King's Shining, but also a film version of Stephen King's Dr. Sleep and made it his own as well. Yeah. Hang and on. it really Hang worked. On. Important question though. Mm-hmm. Is Dr. Sleep a sequel to the NBC television movie, The Shining? It is not. It is uh, not. It is, it is certainly Drop not. the ball. Drop the ball. He could have got all four of them. There is a trifecta. There's... If, if not that you guys want to go and rewatch that that shining miniseries because it's not it's not good it's way more faithful to the book uh, to a fault in many ways yeah. but it is freakish Stephen Weber and only in that series is like totally Christian Bale like his face the way he talks mm-hmm. everything it's like just go on YouTube find a scene you'll see it it's okay. it's weird. Last time I watched it, I had to watch it for some due diligence or something. And I was just like, it freaked me out. Anyway. Um, but yeah, so Flanagan's done all that. Plus, he's also done The Haunting of Hill House on Netflix. He did The Haunting of Bly Manor on Netflix. I think, Chris, you and I have agreed that Hill House was better than Bly Manor. And I, I completely agree. And I think part of it was that uh, Haunting of Hill House was every episode was written and directed by Mike Flanagan. Right. So he produced, wrote, and directed every episode to so a very singular vision. Uh, Bly Manor did not. It was, which is not an issue in and of itself, because a lot of shows have multiple directors per episode, or you know, each episode pretty much has like a different director, and there's multiple writing staff for each episode. So that's not uncommon in the industry, but I think that in the context of this, I could really feel that Hill House was this singular vision. It felt very much like a, a movie that was just like several episodes, whereas uh, Bly Manor felt like a regular TV show. And I, I still really liked Bly Manor, mm-hmm. um, but I would agree. It was, it was not as good as Hill House, although, man, that finale just killed me. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Mike Flanagan. Now, I don't know if you know this, Chris. Uh, you do your research. I'm sure you do, but... Um, Midnight Mass is a story that Mike Flanagan has been trying to tell for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. I believe he originally wrote it as a novel 
And in Hush, there's a scene where like, I, again, I haven't seen the movie, but I've been told this. There's a scene where like the main character uh, throws a book and it's Midnight Mass. Yes. And then apparently he wrote it as a film, couldn't get it financed. And then Netflix sort of gave him the go ahead to do it as a series. Yeah. Um, I was very much looking forward to this. I know you were too. It's, I think you're kind of, if, if Flanagan's attached, you're, you're interested. Mm -hmm, for sure. Yeah, no, I, Flanagan's not only one of my favorite uh, uh, horror filmmakers right now, he's genuinely, genuinely one of my favorite filmmakers right now. I think okay. that he's definitely underrated as far as like kind of, um, kind of global success it, in the sense of uh, he's not necessarily a household name, yeah. but he's one of those filmmakers where if his name is attached, I'm, I'm there day of. Yeah. I also wanted to add that uh, there was also a reference to Midnight Mass in Gerald's game. Oh, was um, it? Yeah, so I have a little screenshot. I'll send it to you. But essentially, it's one of these. It's while she's still tied up, she holds up a book that says Midnight Mass. Okay. So this is something that he's been, like you said, wanting to do for years. This has been something that's that's been ruminating in his mind for a long time. He's written it down in different contexts, whether it's a novel or or probably a very condensed screenplay. Uh, but now, thankfully, I think that. For the benefit, for for the better, this wasn't a, a, a film that was just two hours. This was a miniseries, um, and I think it really needed to have that length to kind of explore all all the nuances of the characters and and the conflicts. Um, so, I yeah, I think if we're ready to kind of jump into it, I I really really loved Midnight Mass. Um, I think that this was one of his stronger efforts and it was it was very surprising and which is part of the reason why I don't I was asking if we were going to get into full spoilers because although this has been out for a few weeks now and it, it it was kind of in Netflix's top 10 kind of like most popular things right now for a bit but it doesn't seem to be quite getting the attention it deserves and I can understand why because this is a very complex uh show it is. this is it's a show that's 90% of it is are two people sitting down discussing religion and that I can imagine that's not really an easy sell for a lot of people but it it's fascinating and it's very I think that anybody that's that's you know been a part of a religion or or is somewhat even re uh, aware of it can find something in this the, this fascinating about about people's spirituality and their beliefs and right. um so yeah, I, th I thought this was tremendous uh, yeah. from start to finish. Yeah, I, I absolutely loved it. It's, um, it had, and, and again, as I mentioned off the top, we're not going to do a full spoilers thing. We're not going to hit every episode and every beat. But mm -hmm. as we talk about this, we may mention some things that I'm sure we will uh, that could be considered spoilers. So just yeah. everyone, you've been warned. Um, yeah, it's, seriously, like last, last thing I'd add is just that I... I went in, I only watched the trailer and the trailer really doesn't give away what this is about. Yeah. So I think it's be, it's really good to go in because it it's not quite what you think it is. Even if you watch right. the trailer, it went into some really surprising areas to at some point, I think I messaged you and I was like, is this about, hmm? and just cause I was like, I had, I had no idea that this is what this was about. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess um, if you guys have been on the fence about watching it, uh, I do have a non-spoiler review on my channel. If you want to check it out, I'll put the thing. Um, go check that out. Definitely recommendation from me. And I, I'm pretty sure Chris would say the same. Yeah, definitely. Uh, go check it out because it's really, really good. Uh, Andres wants to say something. Oh, sorry. Let me un unmute you. Hold on. Wait, you there you go. Muted me. Hmm. You're eating, dude. <laughs> You were just <laughs> eating into the microphone. And so I was like, well, all right, I'll just mute him. That's amazing. I didn't even notice. Oh, I did. <laughs> mm, what I were you going to say? A I, I giant noticed... bag of candy here. Um... I noticed that he was eating. I didn't notice you had muted him. Oh, okay. <laughs> I got too Flanagan out. I am Flanagan. glad you muted me because I wasn't sure how loud these rappers were. Um, no, uh, what I was going to say is I too recommend Midnight Mass. I oh, seen, did you watch uh, it? No. Okay. But I'm saying you guys sound like this is pretty good. And uh, it's very good. You can mute me again. I'm going to eat more. Okay. <laughs> He's going to eat more candy. So <laughs> is the um, season. Yeah. I, so again, um, this is, it's, 
it's simultaneously a, a much different show than Hill House, but yeah. it did go into pretty dark horror that I, more so than I expected, like going in, especially because I was reading some reviews that were saying it's not particularly creepy, which is true. It's not necessarily creepy, but I think that underplays the fact that this goes full on horror. Yeah. It's just horror in a different way. You know, Haunting a Hill House was sort of the creepy, eerie, supernatural. Like, is that a ghost in the background? I think I can see a hand. It's eerie. It's, it's, it's creepy. This is more like your jaw will be on the floor. Like, right. episode six, the, the last 15 minutes of episode six, I was genuinely like just jaw dropped of how insane it was getting. But in the best way, because it was this controlled chaos. Um, and and it, I think it benefits from, from having the majority of the, of the show, like I said, not being so intense. It's really just people talking. There's characters that are questioning their faith. There are characters that are so steadfast in their face, faith and seeing things that are kind of challenging it. Um, so when the hor horrific moments do happen, it packs a punch. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's really got, it, like, it's, it's such a Mike Flanagan thing in that it's very, very character driven. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, um, there are a couple of characters who suffer trauma from mistakes that they've made. I mean, you know, I think the character's name was Riley. Yeah. If, the show opens with him uh, killing somebody while driving drunk. And mm -hmm. then he serves his time in prison. But he's he's still haunted by that. I, it, the character actually reminded me very much of Luke from Hill House. Um, yeah, of course, was struggling with heroin addiction. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I mean, the show is about addiction, trauma. It's very very character driven. Uh, but there's a lot of religion in there, and and I did find out that Flanagan was raised Catholic. He was an altar boy, and yeah. I mean, it really shows when you watch the show because when they go into like biblical verse and what, like it goes deep. Like they, they yeah. found, or we'll get to it. Oops, we'll get to it. But they found like Bible verses that, you know, connect in a way that's pretty well perfect to what they're, what they're going for here. And I guess we should just rip off the bandaid and say that this show involves vampires, mm -hmm. but the vampires are, the priest we will sort of get to the story here shortly, but the priest sort of meets this vampire mm -hmm. thinks of him as an angel. And then we get biblical verse describing angels and what they do and what they look like. And it like, it works. It makes sense. Yeah. And we don't even realize this until like the end of the third episode, the beginning of the fourth episode. And interestingly enough, there is no point in the show where the word vampire is ever used. Yeah. Which I thought was really cool. Mm -hmm. um but yeah so and it also it also brings back flanagan is one of those directors who kind of has a core team of actors that he likes working with mm -hmm. and this show brings back a bunch of them henry thomas who is in gerald's game i think he was in hush he was um, in hush he was in hill house yeah he was in bly manor he was in uh et doctor sleep that's right that's right yeah oh, so yeah, he, he's yeah. Yes. So he's very close to them. Also, Kate Siegel, who is Mike Flanagan's wife. Yep. Um, she's terrific. And yep. I was just kind of going through her IMDb and she's mostly done work just with Mike Flanagan. And I hope right. that she kind of, you know, gets some more attention because she's she's great. She's it's, really good. Yeah. She's terrific. Also has the, the whitest like teeth I've ever seen in my entire life. There was, certain, <laughs> I don't know. I, my wife and I were both distracted. There was like a moment where she was talking. It was like a close up. And we're like, how how much did she go to the dentist? Because her teeth are flawlessly white and straight. Okay. Anyway, that's just a random aside. Um, uh, yeah, you also had like Annabeth Gish in there, who was in uh, Hill House. Um, a few other people. Uh, you have uh, Rahul Kohli, who was in Bly Manor. Mm. Uh, he was wonderful in Bly Manor. He's really good yeah. in this one too. He, oh, terrific! He in so much range. I mean, if you think of a character, if you just watch him, the character from Bly Manor that he played versus the sheriff character that he plays here it's it's like night and day in a, yeah. in a great way it's he's terrific well and I've, I've seen some people uh giving this show crap for having a lot of monologues and it does have a lot of monologues it does they're very elegantly written though and raul coley as the sheriff so for context this whole thing takes place on this little island with like 
you know, a couple hundred people living on it, mostly like devout Catholics. Mm-hmm. Raul Coley plays the sheriff who is a Muslim. And so he's sort of looked down upon by a lot of the people, particularly our kind of main villain uh, who we'll get to. But he has a monologue talking to, um, I can't remember who he's talking to. It might've been uh, Kate Siegel's character. Uh, I think Aaron it was, Green. yeah. Or the doctor, I think it was the doctor. Okay. towards the end right where he's talking about why he joined the police yeah so he goes oh, on this fuck. monologue about you know after being a muslim after 9 11 he yeah. wanted to you know join the police force to show that you know like muslims can be good people and blah blah blah. and yeah. then he gets he gets promoted up the ranks but then it, i don't even want to like go into it too much but it was like brilliant it yeah. was absolutely brilliant like i was i was floored by both the writing of the monologue and his performance of it was absolutely incredible how did that sit with you it's it was great uh i mean his performance is terrific he was one of my favorite characters on the show and it what i really liked about his character is that it really showed that mike flanagan was was tackling these issues of faith and spirituality not not and not only doing it just through one religion you know kind of kind of expanding on it you know there's a character that's atheist in it there's a character that's like i said there's kind of a spectrum when it comes also to the christianity mm-hmm. um or the catholicism to be specific and then like you said you have these characters that are that are muslim and um that's what i loved is that mike flanagan got in depth with these monologues yeah. and with these discussions that really was challenging faith but never i felt looking down on it um yeah. there is one character who's a villain her character's name is bev and she's really the, despite being a show about vampires, she's really the only villain because, I mean, the vampire just seems more animalistic, like doesn't right. really have words. It's just kind of like, I'll feed off people. Um, but she she takes the words from the Bible and she takes this religion and she uses it. She for, weaponizes it. She weaponizes it. Yeah. Where, where, like I said, you see other characters, especially Erin Green, um, the pregnant woman played by Kate Siegel. I get you you see her and how how important religion is to her and how she needs it in her life and you see the the character of the sheriff who has who also talks about you know what happened to his wife because he's a single father now and, right. and something terrible happened to his wife and again it's not looked down on like you i get the impression just by the way that uh the character of riley speaks that mike flanagan has probably lost a lot of his personal faith i was listening- However, I was listening to a podcast last night and he was saying basically he grew up uh, Catholic altar boy. Then he became agnostic. Then he became atheist. And then, so they said, are you, would you say you're an atheist or a Christian? And he said, yes to both. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can really feel that where I think that he, he has kind of those, like, I don't, I don't really believe in this, but he truly respects religion and he truly yeah. respects the need for it while also kind of criticizing like it can be used for for the detriment of people to hurt people to to a bev does some horrible things mm-hmm. and justifies all of it yeah it, with, in her mind justifies all of it through bible verse and stuff that she just kind of twists and manipulates and i thought that's a tough act to, to that's a tough kind of tightrope to walk right of being faithful i mean respectful to people's faith but also being like, hey, there's some things that you can criticize. And I think that a, a less assured writer director would kind of lean too heavily on, on one side, right. which, and, which he didn't. And I, I think, you know, clearly Mike Flanagan is a big Stephen King fan. Fuck yeah. <laughs> and the, the character of Bev is such a Stephen King character. Like, yes. sort of, uh, it's uh, Marsha Gay Harden's character from The Mist, which in uh-huh. the book was a guy, but still. Um, uh, Carrie White's mother, like these sort of religious extremist fanaticism yes. fanatics um, mm-hmm. who, who weaponize <clears throat> religion as exactly what Bev is. And I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the actress who played her, but she was amazing. Uh, it is uh, Samantha Sloyan. That's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She was terrific. And it's because I, I was telling my wife afterwards that it's been a while since I've truly hated a villain. Right, you know, because there's plenty of villains, and a lot of them can be good. Some of them are like good because they're entertaining. You know, like let's say Catherine Hahn in Agatha, or as Agatha Harkness, she was fun. That's a fun villain in a Marvel yeah. show, and it's like, oh, you know, blah blah blah. Um, or uh, what's his name? Uh, Tony Leung in Shang Chi. You you like him? Like, oh, that's a he was a great actor, but you didn't hate him. 
Right. Bev, Bev, though, and I messaged you saying like that Mike Flanagan's inherited Stephen King's ability to to write these thoroughly despicable characters that you right. absolutely hate. It's like maybe not it since Joffrey or or Ramsay Bolton from Game right. of Thrones did I fucking hate a character. And again, played wonderfully by Samantha Sloyan. That I think that's a again a it's it's hard it's it's hard for an actor I think not to go over the top with such a pious piece of shit character right. and she played it wonderfully there are um there are a couple i mean pretty much everybody on the show was really really great but there are a couple of moments that i want to point out specifically um there's a character on the show played by robert longstreet who is sort of like the town alcoholic and we we know there's another character named lisa who is a teenage girl who's in a wheelchair because uh, he accidentally, he was out drunk and hunting mm. and he accidentally shot her, paralyzed her. And there is a sequence uh, at the end of the third episode where she's because of, so basically there's a new priest in town, new priest, we'll get to that, uh, played by Hamish Linklater, who is also wonderful on the show. I, he's, to me that he stole the show i Absolutely. thought that i thought that he was because I've, I've seen him all like in in bit parts because i went through his imdb and be like where have i seen him before and he's appeared here and there this is the first like show or movie or anything that i've really seen him in as like a starring role he fucking crushed it like yeah. oh my god is this guy great yeah um but uh <clears throat> So he comes back into town and eventually we learn about the vampire and he's basically been spi spiking the uh, communion wine with the vampire's blood. So he's slowly, basically people are slowly getting, um, they're getting, their, their ailments are leaving them because they're yeah. not fully vampires yet, but they're getting that, that vampire blood. Mm -hmm. And there is a scene where he's basically saying to Lisa in the chair, like, come get your communion and no stand up and walk to me. And it was such a heavy scene because it's like, it seems like he's being absolutely cruel and like mocking. Yeah. But then she gets up. Mm -hmm. And what that then leads to is there's a scene where Lisa goes to visit Robert Longstreet's character. And mm -hmm. he's, you know, he's never forgiven himself for paralyzing her. She's never yeah. forgiven him for paralyzing her. And she goes on this monologue this was one of the most stunningly acted segments of the entire show mm -hmm. where she basically is telling him how he ruined her life and blah, blah, blah. And like now seeing his place, which is a dump and whatever. And she's like, this is exactly how I thought you would live. Mm -hmm. And the guy's just like teetering on the, on the edge of breaking without saying anything. And then finally at the end, she tells him that she can forgive him and he just breaks. And it was like, absolutely just, haunting that that yeah. scene like broke my heart mm. um what did you think of that it, it, incredible yeah it's it's it was great performances especially from the young actress as well mm -hmm. um because she was she was doing a lot to work with but also yeah. just seeing you know a grown man like that just break because of the forgiveness of forgiveness that he can't give himself right and i what i really loved about it is is that forgiveness really is a theme throughout um mike flanagan's work uh, you know, you mentioned Hill House, how the character of Riley is similar to the character of Luke from that. Um, and that's something that I really respect because a lot. I think that especially if you just kind of go on like social media, a lot of times or Twitter, everybody's trying to cancel everybody. Everybody's uh, I'm not I'm not one of those people that goes like cancel culture, man, because I get that it's like, I don't know. But at the same time, it's impossible to miss if you go on social media, people just trying to drag other people down. If you yeah. make a mistake uh you're done it's over forget about it and i think that for younger generations maybe who just still need a little bit more life experience to realize oh yeah everybody at some point will mess up everybody at some point will fuck up and forgiveness is a virtue for a reason because nobody's perfect and sure maybe you're you're 19 now and you're like i'm the best i'm the be best social justice warrior out there you're gonna fuck up at some point when yeah. whether and when that happens you're going to relate to, to works of art like this that say you can be forgiven. You, you know, nothing, maybe not nothing, but there, there it's in the show makes a clear distinction between people who are willfully doing wrong and people who struggle with addiction, people who, right. who 
don't want to, but they end up hurting themselves and hurting others around them. Right. Um, and that's such an important theme. And it's such a, it's such a beautiful message. And it's, it's, you know, like there was mo multiple scenes like that, uh, you know, where, where Riley also kind of confronts his, his demons as well. Um, and they're just so beautifully done, beautifully written. So like, so respectfully directed. Yeah. Um, great. Yeah. Wise man say forgiveness is divine, but never pay full price for late pizza. <laughs> So there's a Ninja Turtles reference. Um, <laughs> um, Mike Flanagan's favorite film. I yeah, no yeah. doubt. Um, yeah, another another sort of sequence I want to talk about is we find out that Kate Siegel's character, who is pregnant, uh, all of a sudden she's not pregnant. Mm -hmm. She didn't have a miscarriage. There's nothing there. There's nothing yeah. to suggest. There's no, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, the chemicals nothing... in your body that uh, the hormones, the hormones, yeah, yeah. Um, the, like the hormones that should be present during a pregnancy, like nothing's there. Mm -hmm. uh, so she's quite upset, and she has a scene with Riley, and they're talking about what they think death is going to be like in that moment where you transition from one to another. And she says what she thinks, and he says what he thinks. He says something like, "I'm hoping it's just you know my brain will pump me full of dopamine, and I can just sort of hallucinate and see what I want to." And he is the first person uh, who, after the priest brings the vampire back, the priest is now a vampire and, and Riley is the first person he turns into a vampire. And he goes out on a boat with Kate Siegel, who they're, they're essentially they're in love. Yeah. And he takes her out in the middle of the night on a boat because this is something they did when they were kids or something because of the implication. Right. Uh, <laughs> did you think that too? It was a very serious moment, but yeah. I did think that of just always sunny, like, well, yeah. you know, you take her out in the water because of the implication. Right. Um, oh, I love that scene. It's so <laughs> wrong. It's so wrong. I know, <laughs> but that's, that's that whole show. Um, yeah. But he takes her out there and he's basically telling her the story of how he turned into a vampire. And, Again, like I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, he has this trauma because he killed a girl while driving drunk, and that that really yeah. haunts him. We see it visualized, and it's this amazing visual uh, where we see it at the beginning. He sees her dead body, and she's covered in glass, and the glass is reflecting the police pot lights. Yeah. It's a stunning image, but he keeps seeing her when he's trying to fall asleep um, in the same way with the glass and the reflections, and it's, it's really, really stunning. Mm -hmm. But so he takes Kate Siegel's character out on the water and is telling her all this. And then, like you said, the implication she says to him, um, you know, so now now we're out here yeah. uh, alone and you can do anything to me, but I'm not afraid of you. And he's like, no, that's not why I brought you out here. I need you to see so you can believe me so you can get out of this town. And yeah. at, as this scene is playing out, we see that the sky is getting lighter. And finally this was the end, I believe of the episode four. And it was so incredible because the sun is just starting to come up and then the camera focuses on him and it's, it's a call back to the dopamine and he's hallucinating and he no longer sees Kate Siegel's character, but he sees the woman who he killed yeah. and she looks normal. She's not covered in glass. She's not injured. She kind of beckons him. Like this is his, his mind sort of forgiving himself yeah. allowing himself to die as the sun comes up and then it's a smash cut to kate siegel just screaming and we see his body just like burning into ash mm -hmm. did that blow you away as much as it did me because that <laughs> oh my god i i i kind of i i admittedly laughed out loud but it wasn't because i thought it was bad or i thought it was poorly done it was just so sudden that I was, do you ever like watch a movie and something so batshit crazy happens that your reaction is like, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what it was. It was like watching like, oh, wow, this is really beautiful. She's being for, holy shit. Right, and just right. started laughing. Well, I will say, um, have you seen that movie Saint Maud? No. Okay. Uh, I, only, I, only, I only ask because it was a recent horror movie called Saint Maud uh, directed by Rose Glass. I don't want to spoil anything, but there is a moment that, that reminded me of that, uh, where it's a very similar kind of smash cut. And I, and I thought that immediately, and I was like, I don't think this is a reference to that, because the other one came 
well, they were shot probably around the same time. The other one's very recent too, but it was interesting that it was like, I saw two horror movies recently that had a similar kind of like bait and switch like that. Anyway, um, yeah, great. I mean, incredible sequences like that happen quite often where it is a lot of dialogue, it is a lot of talking, but it always kind of builds to something. There's always like a great little button at the end of, of right. sequences that they're really kind of that push it. Um, again, not to go through everything, but it's, it, it's just like really beautiful character work throughout um, amazing themes that happen. They all build up to, to this episode six, which is basically, I mean, no one, from, I don't know if anybody ever planned to do this, but if anybody plans to do a Jonestown movie, they got their, I don't know how they can do it better than this. Right. Um, for anybody that's aware of the Jonestown massacre, if you don't, and want to ruin your day read it up on on wikipedia and just be depressed for the rest of the day but what a fucking sequence like yeah. oh my god um man that's where really the horror comes from and then episode seven is almost like a not an epilogue but it's just kind of the aftermath um right i would say episode seven it i think after when i first watched it there was certain i was left wanting just a few things again without i mean we already kind of spoiled a lot of it but I was essentially, I was hoping for some different resolutions or some better resolutions for some of the characters. Uh, essentially, the only two survivors were two characters that were kind of introduced, or at least one character that was introduced in the beginning. And then we kind of forgot about the rest of the way. And it's like, I think this would have been a little bit more impactful if some of the surviving characters were the ones that we spent more time with. Okay. Um, but there, it, that, those are like minor quibbles, because I think that thematically and narratively, it came together so well. It 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 was sort of like it was simultaneously like I there were different things I would have tweaked here or there about the ending, but overall, this is the only way that it could have ended, if right. that makes sense. Right. Um, I do think we should move on because poor Andres yeah. is getting real bored, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, of course, uh <clears throat> big recommendation from me, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Please check it out. Um even even if you somehow listen to the spoilers talk uh, when you shouldn't have, when you haven't seen it yet, still check it out because it's it's less about the surprises and it's more about the journey. I know that yeah. sounds kind of cliche, but it really is sort it's of true. like, yeah. go, go on this ride with these characters and listen to, to what they were saying. I, last thing I'll say, my sister was like, I watched Midnight Mass. It was pretty good. And she was talking to me, my older sister, by the way. And I was talking to her about it. And she's like, she dropped that. She was like, yeah, I kind of fast forward or skip through some of the monologues because they were just kind of boring. I'm like, fuck you. Like, <laughs> this is not, that's what it's about, really. Like, don't, it's a lot of people talking, but it's good. Don't just yeah. skip it. Even if you think it's boring, I swear it always comes back to something that I think is is important. Yeah, agreed. Uh, so yeah, it's streaming on Netflix now. Check it out. It's really good. Uh, we're going to move on. Uh, Andres and I are going to talk about James Bond, No Time to Die. We're going to spoil the movie. Uh, we're going to give it a review. Uh, Chris is going to hang out and listen to our sort of spoiler free thoughts off the top. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then he's going to dip out for a bit and then jump back in for the horror conversation. Um, for context, uh, I have seen all of the Daniel Craig Bonds. I haven't seen much Bond outside of Daniel Craig. It was never really my thing. Um, Andres has only seen No Time to Die. Uh, Chris, you've seen all the Daniel Craigs, except for No Time to Die, which you've seen later today, yeah? Yeah, mm -hmm. correct. Uh, so Andres, I would say uh, your favorite James Bond with Daniel Craig is No Time to Die. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> Uh, Chris, uh, having not seen No Time to Die yet, how would you rank uh, the four other movies in the uh, in the series? Uh, for me, it would be uh, Casino Royale is is definitely my favorite. That was his first one. I I just love that movie so much. It's genuinely not just one of my not just my favorite Bond film, but it's genuinely one of my favorite films. It just hits the right spots for me. Yeah. Um, then Skyfall, which yeah. I think Skyfall has it's weird because I think Skyfall has better direction. It has better cinematography, but just something, again, something about like Casino Royale setting and it takes place mostly in this casino, just kind of gets to me more, but Skyfall is still right up there. I think that both of them are terrific. Okay. Um, and then kind of on lower tiers, it would be, uh, I'd suppose Spectre and then Quantum of Solace. Um, Spectre was kind of a step down after Skyfall. It was a pretty big step down, yeah. um, which was disappointing. 
but it still has a lot of good things in it. The cinematography is good. It has some good sequences. Quantum of Solace, I just rewatched it recently, was made during the writer's strike. And you can really feel that. Okay. Like, it's just, you can really just feel that it's like, they didn't really have a story here. It's just a bunch of kind of disconnected scenes sloppily thrown together. It's still entertaining. It's breezy and it's not poorly made. But so, yeah, in, in interestingly enough, those films were like, every other one. So it's Casino Royale, great. Quantum of Solace, people don't like that much. Skyfall, people love mostly. Spectre, they don't really love that much. So a lot was riding on No Time to Die. For me as well, I still haven't seen it. So I'm still hoping that it caps off the Craig era solidly. Okay, so I'm, I'm pretty close to your ranking. I'm gonna go Casino Royale, uh, Skyfall, No Time to Die, Spectre, Quantum of Solace. Okay. So for me, No Time to Die is kind of right there in the middle. Um, it's it's quite good. I, I enjoyed it very much. I have some some problems with it. Um, I did, and uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll ask this of you, Andres, even though you haven't seen the other movies, but for me, it felt like a worthy conclusion to the Daniel Craig era. Um, I liked how they closed it up. How did that work for you, Andres? It was an ending, and it was very... Uh ending like right where, where it ended okay so so before we get into spoilers um andres what were your sort of initial thoughts of the movie when you came out of it this does what a lot of modern franchise uh man i can't words i Fran- it's because i ate, i ate so much candy like i was <laughs> i was trying to see how much candy i could eat before you guys were done <laughs> And it was like by my eighth little piece of candy, I'm like, I'm not in my 20s anymore. I got to put this away. <laughs> right. um, so, uh, no, what I was going to say, though, is, you know, there's a lot of modern reintroductions of franchises that have been happening. Mm-hmm. And I feel like this was a very good uh installment in a franchise that it it makes you want to check out the older films afterwards yeah because i my big thing uh we'll do a full disclosure right now i've never really seen any james bond like we had a few around the house when i was a kid on vhs i watched a few of the pierce brosnan flicks Mm -hmm. but i mean when you're seven you can't really grasp what you're watching and you know Mm. So this was really, I went into this completely blind as just your average moviegoer. It's, it's a bit of a flip because usually um, Court's the one who, the everyman, and then I'm the specialist weirdo who's like <laughs> zombies. But uh, yeah. so it was, it was a nice little change of pace. But as I said, what I like about this one is it, it made me want to watch the rest of the James Bond franchise. It doesn't make the rest of them look dumb or yeah. less cool. Mm-hmm. And that is the marks of a good installment. I wish Star Trek would do that. <laughs> I wish Doctor Who would do that. Mm. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right on. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna sort of have to breeze through this because we got to get Chris back for the discussion at the end. Um, so we have to uh, not spend too much time. So again, we're not gonna hit every single spoiler beat. Uh, but we will talk about some specific things. So, Chris, uh, get thee to a nunnery, and we'll let you know when we're done. All right, we'll be back. Uh, just me- just message me. Okay. Okay. So, um, this movie, I saw it with my girlfriend, and she didn't feel the emotional impact as much as I did when we're spoiling everything. Let's when, go for it. When James Bond dies at the end. She yeah. didn't feel that as much because she had only seen Casino Royale, but she also, you know, we also find out that Madeline, who was his love interest from Spectre, uh, so that was was a holdover relationship. Um, We also find out that she has a kid, which throughout the entire film, she's saying is not yours, is not yours. There is a moment in the end, and of course we'll get to this more specifically, but she's talking to him on the phone as he knows he's about to die. And she says, like she does have your eyes. She acknowledges that it's it's his kid. Man, that line got me. That line really got me. I got <clears throat> I got quite choked up. But my girlfriend was like, "Yeah, whatever." <laughs> she, she didn't have that connection with the Madeline character and the connection with the Daniel Craig stuff. Um, how did how did you uh, how did the sort of more emotional stuff resonate with you on this one? Uh I 
kind of the same where it didn't really hit me. But that being said, I did appreciate what they were doing. I mean, it's bold to kill your main character on right. screen like that. Right. Is, is this the first time? I think this is the first time they've actually killed a James Bond on screen. I think you might be right. And that's that's like, I, I'm always, I love bold moves in franchises mm-hmm. because that's just like, wow, you did something, you know. Um, Is this also, uh, I think this is the first... Well, I don't know if it's the first movie, but I mean, this is the first time they're acknowledging that 007 is a designation instead of a, a agent. Like in, I'm not sure about that, but uh, I I like how they handled that too. I mean, it's it took little things like that, and I appreciated. I didn't, but as I said, I didn't have the emotional investment because, you know, James Bond isn't my thing yet. But I am gonna be checking it out, like maybe after I finish Fallout New Vegas, because uh, after I finish a game, I go into movie mode. Right. And I've been wanting to check out James Bond. So getting a taste here, I'm like, you know what? I think I can, uh, yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, I remember when this when this movie was still in production, it came out that it was going to have a female 007 played by Lashana Lynch. Yeah. Uh, who I believe was uh, Maria Rambo in Captain Marvel, I think. Um, and a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of people, neckbeards, uh got all upset like oh female bond what and it's like no 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 she's not bond she's 007 which is the designation bond is retired in this movie yeah bond starts off this movie retired and then they pull him back in of course um i liked lashana lynch in the role i kind of wish she had had a little bit more to do um i felt that for me daniel craig did some of his best work in the franchise in this film um i, I really liked him in it um, I will say Rami Malek plays like the main villain. Yeah. And I thought his performance was good. I like Rami Malek. Man, that villain was just like boring and kind of pointless to me. Yeah, I, I kept, I mean, I got distracted at one point because I'm like, wait, his family does poison, but now he's doing nano, but they're not the same thing, you know? no. So I was like, how are they making that? That requires more than cultivating poisons. But, but you know, it's kind of those like, eh, shh, just watch the movie. It's, well, it was, I, you know, it wasn't about that. It was about this is the final performance of James Bond. You know, the final of Craig's Bond. Right. So I, I was a little more lenient on that. I'm like, shh, just watch. Well, and I, I will say this too. So in Spectre, the last film, because yes. the Madeline character was in that one as well, as I mentioned. There's a scene where uh, Bond is trying to teach her how to use a gun. And she's like, I hate guns. He's like, I got to teach you how to use it. And she she basically intimates that um, she knows how to use a gun because she had to use one as a child, basically suggesting mm-hmm. that she shot a guy. And that's why she hates guns. This movie opens with a flashback to that. Um, where we see the guy that she shot when she was a little kid was Rami Malek's character who came to murder her mother because her father murdered his family. So it was like a revenge thing. And then she goes running and falls into a frozen lake and he like saves her life, pulls her out, which I thought was really, really kind of cool. You wanted to say something? Yeah, I found it. Th- Malik and 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 this actress, they look the same age. So I was weirded out when it was like he's the you know, I know he's probably the appropriate age, but I just I'm like, you look like a 22 year old kid and she looks like she's 22. Right. You got some gray hair. It was weird for me a little bit that that was him. But, you know, whatever. OK. Um, well, I thought it was cool, too, because, you know, she goes into the water and then he pulls her out of the water and then they do this like match cut of her grown up, like surfacing in a lake because she's on vacation with uh, her husband, James Bond, or her boyfriend, or whatever it is. Yes. Um, we should talk about um, my my biggest problem with this movie. Ooh. It was so fucking long. Yeah. Like it just it it was it's two hours and forty three minutes, and it felt like three and a half to me. I don't think it needed to be anywhere that long i understand the sort of reasoning like it's the final bond we got to give it all but did they give it all though Uh... i mean i mean we got we got everything that you expect from james bond you know we got my name is bond james bond we got the 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 shaken not stirred we got the the tuxedo we got the car with the gadgets and the other gadgets and then we got the 
returning villains of Blofeld played by uh, Christoph Waltz. And like, we got it all. But it didn't have to be that long. Like, I remember at one point we were sitting in the theater. I was like, my God, like we're, we're getting towards the end now. And I, I looked at the time and I was like, there's still 45 minutes to go. Uh, yeah, I uh, I had to look it up because I was like, wait, how long is this? And then I looked it up because I had my phone all the way on dark, obviously. Uh, right. I reached the theater right when the movie began. Uh, I coincidentally, I didn't even look the show times up. I was just like, okay, I'll get to the theater. There's a few thrift stores over there. I love thrift thrifting. I bought some tacky zebra print Converse. It's awesome. Nice. I get to the theater. I buy the ticket. And they're like, oh, for the 4.30 viewing it? I looked at my phone, it was 4.34. I'm like, yes, it is. Uh, so I missed all the trailers. Oh, no. Eh. Anyway, uh, yeah, I didn't realize how long it was. Uh, I didn't feel it, though. I'll be honest with you. No. I didn't really feel the length uh, as much as I thought I was going to once I saw, you know. My, my big thing, though, is like, I couldn't, I was like, wait, I don't want to like sit here with a calculator and figure out how much time is left. Right, because you know you get used to like you take a remote and you can see how much is left in the movie. You can't do sure. that in the theater. Nope. No, I actually found like the first two acts were really, really moving. Weirdly, it was the third act where, even though there was so much going on, that's when it really started slowing down for me, and that's where I was kind of going like, "All right, come on." Yeah, the uh, the pacing leading up to the ultimate sacrifice itself. I was like, oh. It felt like 20 minutes passed between his first going up there and then going back. And then it was just like, surely Um, there could have been an easier way to reactivate those silo doors. Right. And before we get there, because we do have to wrap this up fairly soon, but of course, I I do want to point out, um, I was like, you know, watching the movie before I made the connection. So Ana de Armas is in this film. Um, She's wonderful in this movie, but... I didn't even make the connection until she came on screen. I was like, oh, right. They were like the two leads of Knives Out. And apparently Daniel Craig like recommended her for this role. Um, But she's wonderful in it. But it's so weird because she's really started to make a name for herself because she's gorgeous. She's a very talented actress. She was wonderful in Knives Out. Um, She was really good in Blade Runner 2049. But like she's in 15 minutes of this movie. Like there's one sequence where she shows up and they, they kind of do a mission and then she's gone. And I found oh, it very, that lady. Yeah. With the, with the, the dress and the, the, the kickings the um, dress. Yeah. Um, it's like, and I, I liked the way they played her character in that she wasn't sort of your traditional bond girl and that she wasn't, I mean, not that she's not gorgeous. She is, but they're oftentimes very like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? they're they're very they tend to be very buxom and like international is not the word i'm looking for but you know what i mean um granted she's cuban but but she was kind of like fun and playful like they're usually like smoky and sultry and yeah she was like fun and playful she's like i just got out of basic training for being a spy i've been doing this three weeks let's go let's do this it's gonna be fun and i really liked her in it but i was kind of like why wouldn't you ever in more of the movie like yeah, you yeah. get on a day Armas and then just like have her disappear. It seemed odd to me. I, granted, you know, you only needed that character for that piece, but I still she, found it a little weird. Yeah, she could have been in more of it, but I mean, then the film would have been like five hours. True, true. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so basically, like Rami Malik's plan is he's stolen this technology of nanobots, poisonous nanobots, but they can be. Uh, basically it uses dna so if they set it for your dna and it touches you you die uh, horribly what go ahead wanted to touch on that while we're mm-hmm. talking about that it's eerie this plot in this day and age with covid it's eerie having someone on screen saying make sure their families are quarantining i'm like Ugh. right and like these like mass world breakouts and stuff. It's like, oh, I got uncomfortable just because I'm like, well, I know this was made before the, the pandemic hit, but it's, you know, especially in a theater full of people. Yep. I, how, how full was your theater? Mine was pretty full. Uh, there were not, uh, <laughs> there, were, <laughs> there were not that many people in my theater, but like our, our big theater chain, Cineplex, they basically 
they're only allowed to go at a certain capacity. And when you book your tickets, they automatically block seats around you so nobody can oh, wow. sit there. So it's like it's forced social distancing. So we, we no. felt pretty we felt pretty comfortable. Um that was not the case with this one. I went to a <laughs> Chris just messaged us and said uh sexy Sasquatch watch or walk. <laughs> That's what that was. It was pretty cryptid and pretty <clears throat> uh sexy. Uh but no this I, I went to a smaller um local theater chain. They're really yeah. great though. Uh they're playing horror movies all month apparently I didn't know this. I took a picture because I'm like hey girlfriend we can go see uh you know, and she's like, "Ooh, Beetlejuice." Anyway, nice. these guys, these guys do not. They're just like, "Here's the ticket. Go sit wherever you want." Um, I showed you. I, I took a picture. Um, yeah. And I sent it to you guys in the group chat. It's like there were heads in front of me. There was like a guy with a four foot tall stocking cap, right, three rows down, that was blocking the bottom of the screen, and, and there's there a lot of people. But uh, yeah. Just it was, you know. I, I understand this is a swan song. They don't want to change too much, but still, at the same time, it just sucks with a pandemic on the loose. Yep, yep. Uh, uh, so basically, yeah. So we have these these nano poison bots, whatever. Rami Malek's thing is like I don't know, take over the world. It was never really all that clear. Yeah, he was he's just kind of a whatever villain. But um, but what we find out at the end is basically bond um he gets like infected with this stuff it's not going to kill him because it wasn't set to his dna but it's something that never gets out of your body so he could potentially infect anybody he comes into contact with including madeline and who we learn is his daughter um and so he's in this big uh place uh, building whatever uh, World War Two missile silo island, yeah, and uh, they're gonna Which look they're, cool. It did, uh, and they're calling in a missile strike to destroy this entire compound. Compound is the word I was looking for. Ah. Um, destroy that whole thing. So they're like Bond, you got to open the blast doors so we can get the missiles in. And um, but then he realizes he's been infected, and so he's just like, okay, I have to stay here and die, or I'm gonna infect lots of other people including madeline and my daughter and whatever so he has this like conversation with madeline on the phone where he's telling her you know he's he's not coming back and as, as the missiles are coming in and the han zimmer score is really swelling oh yeah, and it was, it was a really good score oh yeah i really liked it but that music was very reminiscent for me of um dark Spunk. Knight. there was a lot of dark Knight in it i pointed that out in my non-spoiler review um, the music at the end was very time from the end of Inception, just like sort of four chords that just like build and build and build. Um, that was wonderful. But that scene, that scene really did get me. It did feel like the end of an era. And like you said, it was, it was ballsy killing off Bond and doing it really, really well. Um, yeah. Just before we move on, how did that ending work for you? I liked it. I liked it. Um, Cause I mean, it's, it's always good. I understand they want to keep franchises going forever, but now that like if a reboot feels earned, it's okay in the public. It's it's okay to do it. To go ahead, just you know. Uh, my biggest question though is like, what's next? Are they going to start doing a a Bond franchise with this new 007 that they've introduced, or is that it? I, I part of me feels like they should do it because uh, that's that's new that's different they've never had a, a female James Bond before let alone uh, and uh, you know a non-white James Bond that's right. this is new territory uh, I know that you know we always have people who rage about these kinds of things you know oh why are they doing this you know neck beards and all that but my big thing and this is why James Bond why this works and why with Doctor Who it didn't work. I know I'm bringing back Doctor Who, but the thing is the only way to do something like that where it works is you have to not make it a big deal. Just right. like, here it is. That's it. D not like parading it up and down the street going, look how wonderful <coughs> this, is, you know, right. where you're like pandering to audiences because audiences, they hate that shit, honestly. Right. And here it was just very frank and matter of fact. She's yeah, that's, that's the double seven. Well, and I, I do know that uh, Barbara Broccoli, who is the sort of producer and her family own the rights to bond. She has said, uh, at least under her purview, 
Bond will never be a woman because that is antithetical to who Bond is. Bond is a guy like that's, uh, which is which is cool because they had another 007, this badass. I can't remember the character's name, but Lashana Lynch's character, and she was awesome. She was a badass spy. I really liked her. Mm-hmm. Um, she just wasn't Bond. So Barbara Broccoli is, has has gone on record to say, at least while she's in charge, uh, Bond will never be a woman. But um, I don't know if they'll change his ethnicity or whatever. I'm I don't know what they're going to do next. I I am told that at the end of the credits they did that thing like james bond will return the way i was sitting through those credits after the length of that movie but yeah um so we'll see what happens with that one more quick thing i want to touch on uh and then we'll get chris back in here and wrap this thing up i thought the script for the most part was really pretty solid i noticed that phoebe waller bridge got a got a co-writing uh credit on it um but there were two lines in the movie and i get it it's a spy movie. You gotta have one-liners. I understand, but Uh-oh. there were two lines that just made me roll my eyes. There was the one guy who had like the camera for an eye, Cyclops. And then, yeah, and then Bond blows it up, and then he's talking on the radio. And they're like, uh, something, something. What happened? And he's like, uh, it really blew his mind. And I was like, but then the worst one, the worst line in the entire film. Oh no came from Lashana Lynch's character. And it's it's bad because it's like a dumb line, but it also references the title of the movie. She goes, she's like squaring off with a bad guy. I don't remember who it was. I don't remember if it was just like some henchman or if it was like a major person, but she goes, guess what time it is? Time to die. I was like, oh, <laughs> fuck off. That was so stupid. Oh my God, that was bad. See, see, I, I live for those lines. Yeah. Uh, and not going to lie, when he blew up the guy's eye and he's like, oh, I just showed him your watch. I laughed out loud. I was the only person in the theater who was like, ha! Okay. I didn't laugh at the punchline though. I laughed at him saying, showed your watch. Right. Um, I was I was that obnoxious guy in the theater. Okay. Uh, I love it. But I mean, that's me though. I love bad one-liners. I'm like, ooh, that hurts so good. So I'm I'm gonna tell Chris to come back and then we'll just uh wrap things up, yes. Yeah, we can uh give our quick little our quick little outro. So yeah, um I mean for me, good movie, sort of right in the middle of the the, the Daniel Craig movies. Um solid wrap-up for this iteration of the character. Way too fucking long. Yes. Um, the 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 only thing that weirds me out about this film was I kept trying to figure out what decade it was. Okay. Because he didn't feel like a modern Bond. Like things looked kind of gritty and vintage seventies ish in in certain aspects. Uh, but I mean, I know they're. I guess they were trying to go for a degree of like timelessness with this take. Well, and I, I, I'm not sure if it was this one or if it was maybe Skyfall or Spectre because I just watched those. But at least in one of those movies, like he's mostly using a flip phone. Um, yeah, I don't remember if that was in this one specifically or not, but like that's you, you don't you don't see a lot of flip phones these days. So yeah, that, that's that's what kind of threw me off going in blind because like from what I could remember from the Pierce Brosnan films, those were '90s films. You yeah. Know? yeah. So the, the, the timelessness, it was weird, but I, it didn't bother me. Um, it was just an interesting little, huh, right. interesting. As and, interesting uh, as that sexy Sasquatch walk. Well, and, and, and just, just quickly, like <clears throat> the part where, um, the part where Blofeld um, has sex with the director on set. Sorry, I'm just uh, fucking with Chris here. God. And that was the Spoilers, best thing. God. That, was, that was the best thing I could come up with off the top of my head. It that didn't un- even make sense. <laughs> that unbreaking eye contact with yes. that one eye of his. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, so so uh, Andres, would you recommend this film? I would, yes. Uh, you can see it blind. It's gonna, and here's the thing. Usually if you go see a movie blind where you haven't seen the others, you're gonna be at a disadvantage. I feel like you're at an advantage in this case. Because there'll be surprises that you're like, you know what? I do want to go back now. Let's see okay. what these other James Bond films are about. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's a recommendation for me. I mean, if you like Daniel Craig in the role, I think you'll dig this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, this is better than Qualtimus Falls. Uh, Chris, what time are you seeing it? Uh, 3.30. 
Okay. That's actually why. That's actually why I have to leave a bit early. Yeah, we got to. Because get... I was like, <laughs> um, I that was the only time I could check it out because I was busy all day yesterday. Okay. Yeah. So we gotta we gotta get you out of here. So we're gonna quickly do our little uh, our little discussion and then we'll wrap it up. So Andres, would you like to pose your discussion question? Yes, gentlemen. Today's discussion question, uh, with it being October, which is Halloween season, I was thinking we should talk about our favorite horror movie franchises and for clarification just to establish what we're doing i i try to be a little more open about this because you know there's different rules what qualifies for me i said for this discussion a franchise is anything that has three or more films even if it's a reboot i still count it as a franchise so who wants to go first uh, i will go first oh, yeah, I, go first. I have the lamest answer okay um, I was racking my brain uh, to come up with something because most of my favorite horror movies are standalone movies, your American World in London, your um, whatever. Um, and a lot of the horror movies that I love that are part of franchises also have really shitty movies in them. They all do. Right. So, <laughs> but and I mean, I, I know this is kind of a lame answer, but I have to go The Exorcist because not only is the first exorcist a brilliant film it's amazing i've read the novel i love it um exorcist 2 is god awful it's so bad <laughs> and then do, the, do. yeah <clears throat> and then the two prequel movies that they made one was called dominion and one was called um i can't remember and they were basically two versions of the same movie one was directed by paul schrader or at least written by paul schrader one was directed by rennie harlan which is a very odd coupling but those are awful, but Exorcist one's amazing, and Exorcist three. And every time I bring this up, everyone's like, "Exorcist three, really?" Listen, it doesn't involve Exorcist two. It's its own thing. It's kind of a sequel to the first one, but it's also its own thing. Exorcist three is my all-time favorite horror film. It's fucking amazing. Um, check it out. That's my answer, Chris. Exorcist three is very very good. Um, partially because it it was originally. It was originally supposed to have even less to do with the with the original yeah. Exorcist. It was um, written and directed <clears throat> by William Peter Blatty, who wrote the original novel and the yeah. screenplay for The Exorcist. And you can really feel throughout The Exorcist Three that this like barely tangentially has anything to do with the franchise. And then at the end, it has like an Exorcist scene. But that's not to, that's not a negative. It's just sort of I think it works where if you if you go in expecting literally a sequel to the exorcist you might be disappointed but yeah exorcist 3 is uh phenomenal um i agree with that as far as franchises i i had to think about this because like you said there's so many franchises where i can pick out sort of like individual films and love them like you know the originally i, I mean the first thing that came to my mind was maybe halloween because i love the original halloween I like Halloween too. Most of the other ones are not good. I like the 2018 kind of sequel. Uh, Friday the 13th is quite good. There's ones that, you know, they're very entertaining. And then some mm -hmm. of them are, they don't really hold up. Uh, so for me, I really felt like uh, I'd have to choose A Nightmare on Elm Street. Hmm. Um, as far as the slashers go uh, from the 80s, Freddy Krueger's always been my favorite. Uh, partially because I think he has the most, I mean, obviously he has the most personality compared to, let's say, Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers. You know, you got the, the wonderful Robert England uh, providing such such charisma, some cackling evil charisma to, to Freddy. And I also just love the concept of it, that he's this, this demon that can kind of go in and kill you in your dreams. And it really, if you watch the movies, even the ones that aren't super great, like the fifth one, I think is uh, the Dream Child. I think um, it's not a good. Is it's either five or six, whatever the Dream Child one is. That one is no good. Um, but even then, it never falls into the trap of just like some teenager running, being chased by a guy in a mask with a with a knife. There's always something interesting going on because it always plays with dreams and you know they, they can go in these fantastical locations and some really innovative kills of freddy krueger becoming a tv and grabbing someone and shoving him through the screen uh or or he's a wicked witch of the west and he's flying on the broom there's so many interesting visuals that come up with it that oh yeah i 
I think that's why I like it the most. It's also part of the reason why the 2010 reboot of it or remake was also really disappointing because it was given a, a you know a proper studio budget and they just did really nothing with it. And this is that's one of it's one of the franchises where I think it it is due for sort of a, a revitalization. Because again, when when your playground, as far as a screenwriter and director goes, is a dream, you could do anything. You could do oh, anything yeah. with that. Um, so yeah, I, I've always loved Friday the third sorry, uh, always loved a nightmare on Elm Street. Um, uh, but again, to to Court's point. I'd be lying if I said that every entry is is golden. Oh yeah, no, that's that's totally fair. As as I said, I, I opened it with like, they're not all gonna be winners. Uh, which brings me to mine. Uh, I had to think about this very long and hard, and then I found my answer. Now the franchise itself, I went for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The franchise itself is by no means perfect. I mean, there's like three four passable good films Mm -hmm. and then there's like 10 in the series and it's like there's some there is some garbage in that franchise but i chose texas chainsaw massacre for one very important reason and the reason is you guys know me i've been watching movies forever i've been watching horror movies i've seen hundreds of titles you know since i was a little kid to now i'm watching movies all the time Mm -hmm. to this day leatherface is the only slasher character who will show up in my nightmares Mm -hmm. consistently like i literally like a month ago i had a nightmare and there he was i was like oh there he is (laughs) So I, I don't know what it is about Leatherface and, and the, the Sawyer family that just really strikes a chord with me, but that's why I'm always like, oh yeah, TCM is where it's at. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a good choice. Um, I was trying to think of the ones that, because it, it, again, like with all of you, there's, they're kind of hit and miss. Like the first one is undeniably just a classic and it's, yeah. it's heavy. I watched, rewatched it just about last year and the last, 10 minutes are almost like visceral overload of just these extreme close-ups and everyone's screaming um the second one goes in a completely different direction but it's awesome because of that um and surprisingly even though i was just kind of crapping on the uh the reboot sorry the remake of a nightmare on elm street the remake of texas chainsaw isn't bad it's not good it's not certainly not necessary but it's it's actually one of the better ones if you compare it to like yeah yeah, yeah. it's it's the one two thousand tens remake that like or two thousands it was two thousand three when it came out it's yeah. the only one where people won't just immediately dismiss it and be like no, no. yeah you talk about Friday the Thirteenth remake nobody talks about that you talk about Nightmare on Elm Street people wince and you know uh, but TCM. 2003 it's like yeah it's not bad and also a great um update of the mask for yeah. leatherface yeah he is creep that he's genuinely a creepy presence even from the you know the first one um where it he i don't know there's something just wrong with him like jason Voorhees and even michael myers they're kind of like this like silent stoic type and some of the masks in the halloween franchises are not good i don't know yeah. how they mess it up but like in that in Halloween four and five, his mask is just awful. But Leatherface is just, he looks, he doesn't seem like this demonic spirit, like, you know, Halloween or or, uh, or Friday the 13th, where they become like these invincible, you know, walking dead. Yeah. He seems like a, this deranged lunatic. Like he seems like a real person that's just wearing someone else's face. And that's yeah. creepy. There's just this like primitive visceral realness to this character that you don't uh-huh. get with the other slashers uh, mm-hmm. out there so yeah yeah all right well i think we should uh we should wrap it up here because we gotta get chris off to his movie um so yeah that's that's the show for today i will say um next week uh, uh it'll be andres's bye week but uh, i just realized this you guys may have noticed i was like looking away because i wanted to get this out next saturday is dc fandom number two. Oh, dope so I think Chris, maybe you and I, maybe that's going to be like the main focus of that show. Unless, I'm unless... hoping, I'm I'm expecting a new trailer for the Batman, and if I'm, that's the I'm case, so. I will talk all day about yep. about the Batman. 
And we also have next weekend coming out as The Last Duel, the new Matt Damon, uh, Ben Affleck, Adam Driver, Ridley Scott film. So mm. we might want to talk about that too, but I, I feel like uh, fandom is probably going to be yeah. uh, the big story there. So um, of course we want to uh, encourage you guys to jump into the comments, tell us what you thought about uh, our topics today. Are you looking forward to the Agatha show or uh, did you like Midnight Mass? What did you think of Bond? Uh, let us know. I do read all the comments. I respond when I can, so don't think those are going unread. Uh, Chris, where can people follow your exploits online? Uh, I have an Instagram page called Art of Light and Shadow. It's a fun uh, daily movie blog. Um, I do a lot of like fun kind of audience participation, whether it's polls or creating kind of uh, ranking lists based off of suggestions from people. Currently, I'm going through the history of horror. Uh, essentially, just every decade, I have a post kind of exploring how horror films and horror cinema has changed uh, over the years. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, check it out. Art of Light and Shadow. Andres? We do a YouTube search for Cheap Thrills, Unspeakable Terror. You will find my videos. I do reviews of low-budget sci-fi and horror from the dawn of cinema to the modern era. And of course, you guys are already on my YouTube channel. Um, if you haven't subscribed, I would love you for it if you did. Um, of course, you can also follow me, not that I post very much, but on Twitter and Instagram at Courtshake. Um, as per always, we want to encourage you guys to drop a like on this video. If you did enjoy it, it helps the video reach more people, helps the channel grow. We appreciate that very much. And we want to remind you as well, if uh, you do, if you are of the mind that we all have faces for radio, uh, you can get audio versions, audio only versions, as you say, of this podcast at places like Spotify, Google Podcasts. So definitely go check that out. Um, uh yeah like subscribe that whole thing okay okay covered it um as always we just want to say um thank you very much for watching and you know we still got to pull together and get through this thing i don't even want to talk about it you know what i'm talking yeah. about but uh, everyone just take care of each other uh be safe be healthy and we will see you guys next week thank you for watching take care guys take care everyone